So the Easter story, which is it? So first question we need to ask is, why do we celebrate Easter when we do? It all has its roots back at a Council of Nicaea that took place in AD 325, where Constantine, who was the ruler at that stage, made a very strategic move to bring harmony between the Jews, the Christians, and the pagans. He looked at um, all these people that were under his rule, and he said, well, you know what, instead of us each celebrating by ourselves, why do we not just combine all your different festivals and feasts to fall on the same date? So the Jewish Passover was pretty much fixed because uh, they always, uh, they have specific times when they have their Passover. The Christians, Constantine kind of suggested to them, well, you know that you're this Jesus man that you're following. Um, he died over the Jewish Passover. So why don't you make your festival at the same time? And the Ishtar festival is what, uh, the pagans were celebrating, which is the spring festival, which is also uh, happens at this time in the Northern Hemisphere. How did they determine the dates? Well, the date is determined on the lunar solar calendar, which is what the Hebrew calendar is based on as well. So we, the way they look at it is they look at which is the first Sunday after the full moon that occurs on or soonest after the 21st of March. And that is when they then have um, the Passover and that is when the Ishtar festival happens. Now the Ishtar festival is uh, with a goddess called Eostra, which um, is the goddess of spring and fertility. And this is always spread, celebrated at the spring equinox, which happens in the Northern Hemisphere. This uh, Eostra is uh, also linked to the um, hormone estrogen. That's where we get that female hormone. Estrogen can chain its roots back to this goddess. The Catholic Church then commanded that Easter must be observed and they did not even appeal to scriptural authority. They only looked at their own authority to make this change. So the Christians then said, okay, well, we'll just call it the Resurrection Festival. The name Easter then so has its roots in paganism after the, this goddess Eostra. It's never used in the original scriptures. And in actual fact, it only appears once in the Bible and in the King James Version. And it's never linked biblically with the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So just a little bit more background of this uh, goddess e Easter, Ishtar, Eostra, depending on which country you live in. Her name, um, it comes back all the way back from the Tower of Babel. And one of her sons was Nimrod, which we do read about in the Bible as well. And she was worshipped, as I said, there, as the goddess of fertility. And that's why um, they have the main festival at springtime, because that is when the earth starts um, going all green again. She was also worshipped as a mediator between God and man. And there was lots of, uh, in her festivals, there were lots of sexual orgy, orgies, temple prostitutes. And there was a lot of um, just parties and festivities. So you can see how there was a, quite a variety of different festivities happening over this particular weekend that was determined according to the full moon. I recently went to a shopping mall that is here, well, not here, but in the Cape. And in the middle of the shopping mall, they had this um, happy Easter, I don't know what you would call it, like a booth. But have a look what they were promoting. Okay.
I'm sure you can see lots of religious significance there. Not one. So basically Easter is now a totally commercialized holiday with all the focus on the Easter eggs and the Easter bunnies, which are the remnants of this goddess worship. So in the Christian faith, they then made the celebration, the resurrection of Jesus, saying that the Friday is going to be the day he was crucified. So they will remember Friday as the crucifixion. And then the Monday, they will remember the resurrection on, of Jesus. There's a lot of different customs which associated with Easter as well. But you can see um, that it, with it being commercial, you can see why the world, and especially in the commercial world, was very keen to keep promoting Easter. Because if you are making uh, quite a lot of money, if you take it, they sell a minimum of 80 million Easter eggs in a period of four days, just in the UK, you can imagine what that income uh, is bringing to the different shops as well. With the Easter customs, they have sunrise. So kind of trying to blend it a bit with the Christian world. There are sunrise services where they have the Pascal greeting, they're clipping the church, they have decorating Easter eggs, which they have now said is a symbol of the empty tomb. They have the Easter lily, which they um, say was a symbol of where Jesus cried, but we'll look a little bit more at that a bit later. Um, and it's a symbol of the resurrection. And then they also have the uh, hunt for the Easter eggs, which the Easter bunny would have planted, and they have Easter parades. So you can see how they have been promoting lots of fun and festivities, which is a lot nicer than going to church on a Friday afternoon or a sun, uh, Monday morning. So looking at the different um, objects that's particularly um, available on, uh, at the shops at this time, we have the Easter bunny. So where does the Easter bunny come from? The Easter bunny was this goddess, Is Yestra, Ishtar. It was her pet. And it uh, was chosen because it's a sexual symbol which shows to fertility and mainly because it gives birth to large litters of little bunnies and especially in uh, the early spring. The Easter bunny comes pretty much from the Germans, because it was a German tradition. And then the Germans, when they migrated to America in the 1800s, uh, they brought it across with them, um, and especially in the uh, state of Pennsylvania. So this Easter bunny then brings on, uh, on a Good Friday, brings baskets filled with colored eggs, with candy, and even toys to the homes of the children on the night before Easter. Similarly to what you have Santa Claus at Christmas time. The baskets are then either hidden or they put it places where the children need to find them in early in the morning, which is where we now have the tradition of the Easter egg hunt. So this hare or rabbit was particularly linked to the pagan worship, but you can see how people adapt pagan worship when it's not convenient. Because in Australia, because the bunny is a pest, they made it an Easter bulby. In Switzerland, because they don't really have bunnies there, they've made it the Easter cu cuckoo. And in Germany, it's now become the Easter fox or the Easter rooster. But be it as may, the Easter bunny is the, well, mainly in America and England, the pet of this goddess of Easter. This Easter bunny brings Easter eggs to uh, the children every, uh, like on the resurrection morning. So very few people actually know where the Easter egg has come from and where all the traditions have come from. So the goddess Astarte, or this Ishtar goddess, was told 
the Babylonians believed that this egg fell from heaven into the Euphrates River. And from this egg, we now have this goddess Easter. And this egg became to symbolize this goddess Easter, who was now born out of this huge egg. Then this egg moved, um, idea moved to Babylon, which, and then in Rome, they started painting the egg with the Christian crosses on to make it more holy. And it's uh, and to make it sacred and it's now was taken as a, a sacred emblem in China, Japan, Northern Europe. Uh, in Greece, they would actually dye the Easter egg red just to make it associated with Jesus's death so that it looked like blood. And a lot of uh, other people then said, you know what, because the egg looks very much like a tomb, let's say the Easter egg represents the empty tomb of Jesus. Can you see how all these uh, traditions now start uh, blurring with one another? And the Christians then, because it had the cross on, could now also quite easily uh, link this um, egg and celebrate it in church as well. The tradition used to be that it was um, dyed East, uh, normal chicken eggs, but that doesn't sell so well. So Germany was the first company that made chocolate Easter eggs. And naturally from that, we now have just chocolate Easter eggs and no longer general proper chicken eggs to enjoy on the Easter uh, crucifixion day. Then there's the Easter lily. Now, the Easter lily is most of, when you speak to Christians, uh, most of them have linked the Easter lily to a verse where Jesus uh, talks on the Sermon on the Mount, where he says, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin, yet Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. So these Easter lilies are also called the white-robed apostles of hope. And they are said to be found in the Garden of Gethsemane after Christ's agony. So in most um, churches at Easter time, they have uh, a lot of these lilies in the church and at um, the altars, and especially with the Catholic religion, wherever there is um, statues of Jesus, they will have this uh, Easter lily. It is said that now, even in this modern age that we're living in, that in the Garden of Gethsemane, there are certain areas where this Easter lily blooms in abundance, and they believe that is where Jesus's teardrops fell and made the ground sacred. We also, uh, yeah, because, and so they've linked it very much to the resurrection and to everlasting life. You will also find in some paintings of old that when the angel Gabriel came to Mary, he comes with a Easter lily in his hands and also or like a whole bouquet of Easter lilies um, coming to uh, come and tell her that she was going to become the mother of Jesus. There is also uh, a story that goes around that tradition again, that says in the Garden of Eden, when Eve left the Garden of Eden and she had these real tears of repentance, that these remorseful tears now became uh, lilies. So it's a very beautiful flower and it has got the, uh, been um, attributed, well, the purity and grace is now attributed to this white lily and it is now said that that is the flower of Easter time. So we now have uh, all of these different symbols that's all around us because of commercialism and that's coming into the churches and they all look, they taste good, they look good, they smell good. And gradually, because it's not making harm uh, in that particular moment, um, it's moving into churches and into homes and into uh, different people's family lives. So it's very uh, 
we have to be so careful when we are almost bombarded with these kind of uh, actions and traditions that are all around us. So that would be, as I would say, the commercial side um, of Easter and the way that uh, most people are celebrating Easter at this time of the year. So a quick summary before we move on to how we should really be celebrating Easter. We've got the Easter eggs, which now in the Christian faith represents the resurrection of Jesus. We've got the Easter bunny, which um, is fertility and the spring festival. Many people have Lent where they uh, for 40 days before Easter, where they um, only eat pretty much soft pressed pretzels during Lent because it's only made with flour, salt, and water. And they also give up something uh, for those 40 days so that they have a sacrificial life. So you can actually decide what you want to give up, whether it's listening to, so going to social media, giving up coffee, giving up chocolates, but that fast gets broken tomorrow. There's the butterfly, which also represents the resurrection of Jesus. And many in many cultures, they actually wear new Easter outfits on Easter Sunday because they believe it would bring them good luck. So that's kind of what most people can find on the internet as well. And it's pretty much what we're surrounded by and what is being celebrated by your more orthodox um, churches. So how should we celebrate Easter? So Easter is, as we know, what took place when Jesus died and Jesus being the symbol of the Passover lamb. We know it was it happened over Passover time. But should we not rather then, just as the Christians of old, before it became all blended and merged with uh, pagan worship, remember the crucifixion, the resurrection and uh, of Jesus. So it's a festival of remembrance. Interestingly enough, the word Passover or Easter in the Bible actually looks very, very similar. And the only time the word Easter appears, and that's only in the King James Version, is in this verse in Acts chapter 12, verse 1 to 4, where Herod the king was getting really frustrated with uh, the Jews, and he had just killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And then when he saw, oh, this is making the Jews really happy, he further took Peter, um, uh, it arrested him as well. And then in verse 4, we read this. And when he, he, that's now Herod, had apprehended Peter, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldier to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. So that word Easter is the same word as Passover, and the original translators, it's the word Pascha, it only appears 29 times in the Bible, of which 28 of those times it was translated Passover, and only this time it's translated Easter, and only in the King James Version. All the newer versions have made it uh, Passover again. So suggestions that have been brought forth is that possibly because it's Herod that is intending um, to take a certain action, he knew about Easter, pagan worship, rather than Passover, and they just used the word Easter in that respect. So be that as it may, uh, it's the only time it does appear, but as I say, it is only in the King James Version that you will find the word Easter. So Easter is actually not a biblical word, as in the word Easter, we should be referring to the Passover. The Jews celebrate Passover at the same time, and that's pretty much the Jewish spring festival where they remember the exodus from Egypt, where uh, the angel passed over, the households had, had the blood on the lintels. And they have, it's a very, um, it's a family feast, but it's a very, uh, it's a more feast of remembrance. They read from the Haggadah. They only eat unleavened bread. It has prayers and songs. And it's a time of celebration from freedom, uh, of giving you freedom from say, slavery. And there's a lot of joy 
in the family. So you can see similar uh, ideas as to what we have when we live a life in Christ. So then we come to how should we as followers of Jesus view this time period that lies ahead of us? So similarly to what, um, you know, as they say, but acting out the days as what Jesus would have done, we remember the crucifixion because that was the first thing that Jesus, um, that happened to Jesus on Good Friday. But when we think about the crucifixion, we can read there in Romans 6 from verse 8 to 9, that if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God in the same way. Count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So we remember Christ who has died so that we have hope for life everlasting. And in John 11, verse 25 to 26, Jesus says to the lady, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live. And even though he dies, whoever lives and believes in me will never die. So when we think of Jesus' death and the crucifixion, it was a painful death. It was something that um, Jesus went through, but it as the Passover lamb, symbolic of that, but something that then brings us hope uh, in this world that we live in. With the resurrection, the is what we really are very thankful for, that he was risen. If we only had the cross to remember Jesus by, we would not have had no hope. But because he was risen from the dead, we have this joyous hope of being in the kingdom. And we read in Romans chapter 1, verse 4 to 5, Jesus Christ our Lord has shown to be the Son of God when God powerfully raised him from the dead by means of the Holy Spirit. Through Christ, God has given us the privilege and the authority to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them so that they will believe and obey him, bringing glory to his name. So the resurrection has given us a privilege and it's given us an authority to tell everyone about the gospel. And it's bringing us a responsibility to speak about Jesus and how he has affected our lives. And in 1 Peter 1 verse 3, we read, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So the things that we are remembering, which is so different to having the Easter bunny and the Easter eggs, but rather sober and reflective periods over this four days that lie ahead. But did the Bible ask us to remember Jesus in this way, having to go to church and have church uh, meetings on Friday and then again on the Monday? And I believe he doesn't. I believe he doesn't want us just to remember Jesus' death and resurrection on one day or one weekend in a year. He says, remember me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 26. And the first time Jesus says this is in Mark 14 verse 22 to 26, where Jesus at the Last Supper says, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said, this is the blood of the New Testament which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung and hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. From this we can see that having the breaking of bread is essential in the life of the believer. Because Jesus says that he will not drink of it again until he comes um, 
at its kingdom time with the kingdom of God. In John 6, he says similar things. He says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove amongst themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say to you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Did you note the words he used? You have no life in you. If we don't partake in the life of Christ, his life of service, the crucifixion and the resurrection in our daily lives, and also partake of the emblems regularly, we don't have access to true fellowship with those of like precious faith. And then in Acts 2, we read of the newly baptized. Then they gladly received his, they gladly, that gladly received his word, were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them 3,000 souls. And what did they do? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So they as well, the early believers, saw the necessity of breaking the bread on a daily basis and having fellowship with one another. And this is how we are commanded to remember the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus, not just over one weekend, but very, very regularly. As we do, every Sunday when we partake of the emblems. As in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 16, we read, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the participation in the blood of Christ? And the bread which we break, is it not the communion or the participation in the body of Christ? So Paul is pointing out to the Corinthian believers here that the memorials are not just bread and wine, but they are the symbolic res um, participation in the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So weekly, when we share this essential meal, um, it will represent our commitment in baptism to live a life of self-sacrifice as our Lord did, with, and with doing it with people who share the same hope as us, and not just leaving it as the world in the other churches is encouraging people to do it over the Easter weekend. So what is our choice? Well, here's a couple of facts again about Easter. There's 500 million eggs each year that's produced and distributed around the world. This is, if you stack them all on top of one another, it would be 10 times higher than Mount Everest. There are Easter eggs, the Easter egg market is worth 220 million pounds each year. So you can understand why in the shopping malls, we are not seeing uh, crosses and the empty tomb like you would see at Christmas time and have the nativity scene. We only have the Easter money and the Easter egg because it's bringing money in the pocket to a lot of people. 
or we can enjoy Easter time because it gives us holidays, but we don't need to feel guilty that we are not going to uh, specific memorial meetings on the Friday or on the Monday, but rather enjoy the fact that this pagan holiday has given us a time period where we can spend it in greater fellowship with uh, one another. And Use it as a time of reflection to remember Jesus and his crucifixion, but not to specifically feel, as the young people this morning were saying, that a lot of them were told that if they don't go to church tomorrow and if they don't go to church on Monday, then they can't be true Christians because they should be following Jesus. And this is my prayer for all of us, which is in Philippians 3, verse 10 and 11. That, yes, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. So I hope I've given you some food for thought and uh, look forward to our discussion time. But before we move into discussion, let us just close in prayer. Dear Lord and our Father, we are so thankful that we have your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in our lives, that we have his awesome example to follow, knowing that it's a life of humility, of service to one another, but that in following him, acknowledging his crucifixion, and the resurrection, it has given us a hope of new life. And that weekly, as we remember your son, we will reflect on what it cost you and what it cost your son and appreciate and respect it and work as true servants of yours. We thank you that in our walk towards the kingdom, we have fellowship with persons of like mind, that we can encourage one another, strengthen one another, and especially when the world tries to draw us away from serving you in simplicity, to stand, be able to make a stand and to have an answer ready when people are wanting to encourage us to follow ways that are not in accordance with your word. We pray especially for our Lord Jesus to return soon, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen.